Okay. Right. Okay. I'm going to start. Welcome. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Amanda Reynolds, and I'm a program analyst with the Fire and Resource Assessment Program here at CAL FIRE. Also joining me from FRAP is Tadashi Moody, who um, manages our Forest Health Research Program and our monitoring program. Um, I'm excited to welcome you to this presentation from one of the grantees from our Forest Health Research Program. Uh, we're joined today by Dr. Jim Thorne from UC Davis for his presentation, Linking Risk of Climate Change and Wildfire to Tree Nursery Inventories to Guide Cone Crop Surveys. Um, before we start, we have some housekeeping rules. Um, and so, just so that you know, the meeting is being recorded. Um, we will record the webinar portion of the meeting and stop the recording before the Q&A. Um, you're welcome to type the questions, your questions into the chat at any time. Um, once the Q&A session is active, you're welcome to raise your hand using the little hand raise button. Um, or you may type in the chat at any time during the webinar um, if questions do come up uh, through the presentation. And we'll do our best to have all of the questions answered do during the Q&A session. Um, and then to introduce the program, I'm going to hand this off to Tadashi. Thank you, Amanda. Um, yeah, thanks. This is um, um, these are exciting uh, presentations for us because uh, these are opportunities for us to sh to um, get some of the information out that has been generated through our grant program, which is the Forest Health Research Program. Um, the the mission of the grant program is to is sort of fourfold. Um, one is identify and prioritize research topics um, in forest and fire science that's that are critical to the state. So we take some um, efforts and uh, careful consideration and understanding uh, where the knowledge gaps are um, in terms of uh, the, the information that we need to make sound policy decisions um, for the state to make sound policy decisions. And then we like to we try to fund um, science in those areas. Um, and we want to fund sound, science, sound scientific studies that support not just our agency, but forest landowners, um, fire man, other fire management organizations, and, and um, even private landowners within the state. Uh, we want to ensure that the scientific information is, that we generate from the program is made available to support um, decision making and policy. That's why we're here today. Um, and uh, we also want to make sure that we're furthering the goals of the California. Of, of several um, sort of guiding strategic documents for the state, including the California Wildfire and Forest Resilience Action Plan, um, the California Forest Carbon Plan, and our um, supporting uh, um, sort of um, program, which is California Climate Investments. To date, our program has funded 74 competitive grants for over $25 million. Um, and of course, if you want to find out more information, it's on our website, which you can't really click the link there, but um, we can put it in the chat for you. Um, and with that, I will um, hand it back over to Linda. Awesome. Thank you, Tadashi. So without further ado, I'm excited to introduce Jim Thorne. Dr. Thorne is a landscape ecologist at UC Davis interested in operationalizing climate change adaptations. He focuses on developing data linking trends to projections and synthesizing multiple data types. He has worked throughout California and he did field work associated with the first statewide vegetation map, the Gap Anal Analysis One, published in 1998. People who have contributed to this project are postdocs Jesse Godfrey, Joe Stewart, Clancy McConnell, and persons extraordinary Ryan Boynton, Kristen Safiro, oh, oh, sorry, Kristen Shapiro, and uh, Jessica Wright. And without further ado, take it, uh, take the screen. Okay, well, uh, right. thanks so much for the opportunity to present. And let's make sure that this is going to work. Do you see my screen now? Yes. Mm -hmm. OK, well, uh, thank you everyone for your interest. And uh, you know, the alternative title, the alt title to this might be a triage map for finding at-risk ponderosa pine cones. 
Uh, and so what we're going to do is we're going to look at various types of risk, uh, operational priorities, and how those play out against the uh, the legacy inventory approach used for forestry that is the seed zone elevation bands and uh, uh, called, which I'll call SEBS. And I'd like to thank my collaborators. As uh, Amanda mentioned, uh, there's many. Uh, Jesse, Kristen, Ryan, Clancy, Kami, Matt Ritter, uh, Denya Troxel, uh, various other folks from the LA Moran Reforestation Center, uh, Emily Moran, Professor at UC Merced, Joe Stewart, postdoc here at UC Davis, Jessica Wright, geneticist, UC, uh, US Forest Service, and Stuart McMurrow. And the funding came from uh, FRAP's CCI approach, but uh, is fun following on funding that came from the LA Moran Reforestation Center uh, and now is being augmented by UC Office of the President's Applied Climate Science Initiative, uh, a grant there. So the main intent is to try to support strategic cone operations. You know, the reforestation cycle, we'll look at that in a moment, but uh, it starts with going out and getting the seed. And, you know, the people who've been driving pickup trucks around and looking for cone crops, maybe we could bring some uh, spatial analysis to that to help uh, bring efficiencies and identify places that might be missing from the, the efforts to collect seed. Uh, and it, it combines with the LAMRC and, you know, we've developed a method for ranking high risk seed zone elevation bands, SEBS, uh, by species to better inform cone, scop cone crop scouting. And there's going to be five parts to this presentation. Uh, why a triage approach uh, and then developing individual species range maps, which I'm uh, quite excited about. Envi uh, assessing the environmental risk to uh, one species, we'll use Ponderosa as the example, looking at the operational priorities for seed collection, uh, according to the Reforestation Center, uh, and then coming up with a final SEB ranking, and if we have time, demonstrate how uh, the tool could be used. So why a triage approach? Well, uh, climate change is well underway in California, and as you can see with this 10-year rolling mean from 1900 out to 2022, uh, nighttime lows have increased. That's the red line. Uh, precipitation is varying all over the place, but it's been low, uh, and associated with those climatic water deficit has been climbing uh, quite extensively. Uh, we've known that there's pro losses in Ponderosa Range for quite a while, the image on the bottom left shows about an 80 year jump of the lower edge of mixed conifer forest in the Sierra from the 1930s and in the aughts, the 20 aughts, uh, with the purple being the areas that have uh, no, that are no longer in coniferous forest. Uh, and of course, there's wide reports of different types of mortality, including uh, bark beetles and, uh, you know, di different pesting pathogens as well as wildfire. So because of that, the reforestation pipeline is inactive, is, is active. And it starts with cone surveys and cone sampling and cone collection numbers one and two in the this nice circular diagram from the LAMRC. Uh, and that's really the area that we'll be focusing in on today is can we bring climate and climate change anticipation and other factors to bear in a systematic way to identify high priority areas to to examine for cone crops. Okay, so how are we going to do that? Well, the first thing is to develop range maps and nobody's really tried to develop an existing range map for different conifer species uh, for about 40 years since 1972, maybe even 50. Uh, and so we, the, the previous one was the Griffin and Critchfields, and they uh, collected data from a wide range of sources and they came up with an existing map that you see there. So we've now scanned and digitized uh, this map and then we've gone through and we've added extensive other records that either remove or add areas to this range to try to create uh, a final a final range map for Ponderosa Pine 
uh, and the other species. So uh, just very simply graphically, uh, we, we have uh, different mapping events uh, that have been going on, including uh, the Cal California Department of uh, CDFA, Forest and, <laughs> Forest and Wildlife, Fish and Wildlife, and they have done a lot of mapping using uh, the VegCamp approach. So we've used their vegetation maps. We've used about uh, 30 or 35 different plot-based vegetation plot data uh, as well to adjust the original map. The lower left shows where range was taken out from the original Ponderosa uh, of Griffin and Critchfield, and blue shows where it has been added in thanks to uh, other survey efforts. And this finally leads us to a view of the existing extent of Ponderosa pine in California, covering 62,457 uh, square kilometers. So that in and of itself is represents a, a, a fair piece of the work that we're that now going to be uh, looking at. We've also done it for four other species, for sugar pine, uh, red fir, white fir and Douglas fir. Uh, and now we're in the process of, with uh, Clancy and a, a new project of trying to add additional species to this uh, essentially puzzle-like approach to building the range, extensive range. These extensive range allow us to uh, do all kinds of things with regards to what might be lost or what might be gaining, where you have diseases, what percentage of the range of the species. Uh, those are all things that could be compared against these updated range maps. Okay, so the first thing we do then is to say, okay, here's the range of Ponderosa, and we'll use a climate exposure analysis approach that uh, I developed with CDFW uh, for the previous fourth climate assessment, which basically says what parts of the range today are at uh, in unusual climates for this with regards to the frequency of the range and what parts of it are uh, in blue and the, the climates there are much more common. And so what you can see here with the progression from left to right is we can see which parts of the Ponderosa range are starting to light up as being, hey, this is in really unusual climatic conditions, infrequently occupied conditions compared to the uh, baseline time period of 1981 to 2010. Uh, and I'll draw your attention particularly to the Southern Sierra over here and the, the transverse ranges. We'll look at that in a little more detail. Okay, so now we've got a climate exposure and we've got a range map and we're gonna intersect it. We're gonna uh, say, well, which of the seed zone elevation bands, the SEBs, intersect that? Uh, and here you see the, the SEBs on the right-hand side with the uh, 500 foot elevation bands showing for one of our favorite suspects, uh, seed zone 526 outside of Sacramento. And what we're gonna first do is we're gonna say, okay, the analysis approach that we use uh, looks at the frequency distribution of climate and it has two wings to it or two uh, sides. It, uh, there's the frequent climates are in the middle and there's one end of it that runs off to being hot or dry and the other one goes off to cool and wet. And with regards to scouting, we didn't think that the cool and wet areas needed to be a high priority place to go look. So we've started now to modify uh, the SEBs. We've, we've got 740 SEBs with Ponderosa, where the Ponderosa range occurs. And some of those we don't think we need to look at because they're in the 10% wettest or coldest, or they, uh, we're also going to remove things within those SEBs that are unlikely to hold Ponderosa and not include them uh, in our, our, our ranking. That would be habitat types like urban pasture, cropland, high severity burns. We'll talk a little more about that. Uh, and uh, some SEBs just had extremely low amounts of uh, Ponderosa pine area in them. So if there was less than about nine or 10 hectares of, of Ponderosa stands within uh, one seed zone elevation band. We also put those to a low ranking. We didn't get rid of them, but they now are not going to be uh, priority ranked 
they'll, they'll be in the low end of the priority rankings that we finally come up with. So then how do we get to uh, clocking the condition or classifying the condition in each SEB? And the main thing to look at is number three here, where we have basically said relative to the full free distribution of climates, uh, we're going to look at which of the SEBs have a high climate exposure already by 2010, which of the, and that we're going to score that with a five, which of them have a go into a high climate stress condition by 2040, or that gets a four, by 2070, 2069, that gets a three, and by 2099, that gets a two. And so the colorized map that you see there is now no longer just the exposure, it's when does that particular seed zone elevation band enter into a high climate stress condition based on uh, the single GCM that we used? And I looked at a lot of different GCMs, but I picked a hot and dry one because the range of, uh, it, it certainly seems like we're moving in a hot and dry direction. Uh, and there's, there's um, so planning for a worst case, hoping for a better uh, is how we've approached this. All right. So here you can see it a little bit more uh, clearly with the uh, the climate exposure ranked by SEB for each of the different time periods into the future. Uh, and you can see them moving across from left to right and then uh, a, a final view of it. And let's see, I think you've seen the same view already. So let's look at an analysis of those SEBs then. And what you can see here is that of 126 SEBs that are that intersect with PIPO's range below 2,000 feet, 22 are already at high climate risk and another 17 are projected to, to uh, either they have already or they'll become high climate stress by 2040. Uh, and by the by 2100, nearly half of the the SEBs in the lowest elevation will be at a, a high climate risk element. Uh, and you can see that pattern following through in other elevation bands as we move up uh, in the state. So there's uh, and you can see that the for example, that orange band is starting to really come in to play in the 4000 to 5,900 or 6,000 feet uh, by 2070. Uh, and so that's letting us see the progression of upslope progression of climate change, which is consistent with a lot of things that we've seen uh, previously, both the, the loss at the lower edge of Ponderosa that's been widely reported uh, and the progression of, of things moving upslope, not only uh, species, but also uh, climate conditions. So that was climate change. We also wanted to address wildfire risk, uh, and we're going to do something similar. We're going to look at the risk for high intensity wildfire by SEB, uh, but there's some places that we think uh, probably uh, won't be, you know, don't get counted in that, and that includes places that have uh, burned relatively frequent, relatively recently. Uh, so we can give them, uh, we can use the fire return interval departure to identify uh, how long has it been, and that'll be our basic proxy. And then from that, we're going to remove CWHR types that uh, are not really part of, of the uh, fuels accumulation. That would be urban and pasture and cropland or high severity burns in the last decade or so, uh, which are areas that uh, may not be regenerating. And again, if the, if the are only a few uh, grid cells within a SEB, then those get the, all of those get moved to a low ranking. And so we calculate the relative fuel load heading into 2023, uh, now 2024, but this is from, we just finished the study. Uh, we assign any SEBs in the last slide to very low, uh, and then we come up with our four-way ranking of we think there's quite a bit of fuel on the landscape or it's moderate or it's low or it's very low uh, as you can see there in the number four and then here's an image of that 
for the ponderosa pine uh, cut into the sebs. So now we've got uh, high fire risk in some places and low, and we've, uh, we've accounted for the fire perimeters uh, out of the FRAP data, and we've accounted for high intensity burn areas. Those have been integrated into this image. Okay, so we have climate and we have high fire intensity risk uh, classified now, and we're going to combine those. And when we combine them, we come up with a nine way ranking that goes from low to high. That's on the right hand side here. Uh, and so a, a combined climate change risk and wildfire risk index uh, for each SEB uh, is seen there uh, on the right hand side. And some of the ones that are in the Southern Sierra or the transverse ranges, SoCal, uh, are popping out quite high uh, in this regard. So you could just uh, work with this. So this is a, a GIS layer and you could come, we can come back. I'll hopefully have time to show you uh, a quick demo of pick a, pick a SEB and then zoom to it and have a look at it. Uh, but of course, this is not happening in a vacuum. It's ha nurseries are dealing with uh, many operational priorities. And so the uh, CAL FIRE LA Moran Reforestation Center located here in Davis had three different categories of uh, seed demand that they are interested in. Uh, and we've uh, brought those in as well as another set of criteria. So the first one is where are we? Where are they seeing uh, requests for seed from? Uh, and so we've identified which seed zones uh, have high uh, order requests coming into the LAMRC. Uh, the second is there was an internal assessment of what would it, how much seed, how many bushels of seed would we need to reforest 25% of each sub uh, that are in the privately owned acres. Uh, and so that's a, a ranking of how much we think we need for reforestation purposes. Uh, and the third is the actual supply. And so part of this project digitized uh, the uh, seed lot inventory that was previously on these wonderful old cardboard cards that were locked in a bank vault, an old, uh, you know, gold, gold country era bank vault at the LAMRC. And those are now digitized. And so we can identify uh, how many bushels of ponderosa pine there are for every seb, and we can rank those from uh, none to high. Uh, and so then we can come up with an overall, we can combine all of those for operational priority. And so the map on the right hand side is illustrating what might be the highest priority zones just based on operations. Yeah, and so here's a little bit better view of that map. You can see that uh, a lot of different places get lit up. And the one of the things that we see here is that the low inventory and the high need across the state has the majority of the SEBs uh, in the upper half of, of the whole rankings here. So finally, then we can take our combined risk and our combined operational priorities, and we can put those together into a ranking and look at those by percentage. Uh, and so this map then illustrates the by percent approach uh, with the areas in red are the ones that are have, get the highest score across all of five of those categories. Uh, and the ones that are in blue are down at the bottom end of that continuum. OK, well, so there's a spreadsheet. Uh, if we have time, I'll, I'll show you the spreadsheet. But it looks like this. And you can see there's a climate exposure, high fire risk intensity uh, combined, the current landowner demand, the projected demand, uh, the current supply operational, and then we have a ranking. And so you could take this and you could sort it for whatever criteria you think are the most important or other criteria could be added into this as well, as long as they're ranked across the entire 740 subs of Ponderosa range. Uh, and then those can be tied back to uh, for pre-scouting conditions, then we've also added in uh, an estimate of the length of roads that are in a SEB that go through the 
ponderosa range. And so here, the grid cells that are in red are, and, and are transparent, those are places that are in our highest risk category. Uh, and if you were getting ready to send somebody out there to go look for seed because those pine, cone, those pine trees might not be there, then you can use uh, imagery as we have here to see if uh, there are, there, you know, there's something still there and to look at what the potential routes for that might be. Uh, and, you know, so here now we've ranked it, uh, that last one was just by the climate exposure. Here now it's ranked by our priority ranking and we're in uh, a place that's already high. It's, we're down there over by, it looks like by San Jacinto, San Bernardino. Uh, and there's still some trees there, so I think that would be a good place to go. Uh, we found an awful lot of places that look like this. So where it was ranked as high risk, uh, but, uh, and this is just in the, on the climate side, but ranked as high risk. And when you bring up the imagery, oh, well, there, you know, there's nothing there. It either got burned, looks like this one was on a burn, or uh, it, you know, it just doesn't have that type of a habitat. Uh, and unfortunately, there were quite a few of those around the state. But this is, you know, this is the demo of how that, how it could be used. So here's another one that's over in the transverse ranges, uh, uh, a high climate exposure uh, in the near term, and uh, still remaining forest, and could potentially be a place to go look for maturing cone crops. I didn't mention, but you know, you have to find trees that have a good set of cones on them, a stand with a good set of cones, and then follow them through the course of the ripening and, and collect them just before they uh, drop. So uh, it's, a, it's quite a labor intensive thing and we're hoping that this geospatial approach can help to identify either mismatches between where people are currently, you know, scouting crews are already going in places that have high risk or, uh, you know, used in other applications. And, and so just to uh, to kind of finish with the, the slides, 62,450 square kilometers of Ponderosa, uh, and we've seen about 39% of that has had some sort of a wildfire uh, in the, in the um, last, uh, since 2000, right? So about almost 40% of it has had fire. Some of that fire could be good. Uh, and about 9% of the area, between 9 and 10%, has had high severity burns since 2012. So that's, I'm hoping, can be, can illustrate where a, you know, a solid boundary range map, which itself could be updated with uh, additional surveys and data as we go along, uh, can be used uh, potentially in other types of applications as well. So with that, I'm going to jump out of the slides and just show you that here, can you see, a, I hope you're seeing now a spreadsheet. And we could we could sort this by a variety of the same categories that I was showing you before. And I've, I've pre-selected one just uh, for expediency's state, sake. I picked a seed zone 570 from 4,000 to 4,500 feet, and then brought it up in imagery over here to, to have a look at. Uh, and so that's just demonstrating that uh, but a, a nursery manager or somebody running in the uh, reforestation zone could just use the spreadsheet and then uh, jump over to see what the location looks like uh, elsewise. And so with that, I think I'm done with, with uh, presenting and we can open the floor for questions. I don't, I'm not sure if I... Hey, hey, hey now uh, stop sharing or or how you, you can you can it. you can stop, stop sharing or you you can i'm well, getting a little feedback here um you can also yeah. leave it up if you like um if it would help to um answer some of the questions as they come up oh yeah it might so i'll put this slide deck back over here okay well thank you i'm going to thank you um jim for this uh presentation it was um there was a lot of information. It was very exciting actually as well. Um, I'm gonna stop the recording for now um, and we can go into our um, uh, Q&A. So let me stop that now.